Good morning or afternoon, everybody, and welcome to FISMA Fridays. And our topic for today, what to expect from FDA and FISMA in 2015. We're very excited that the uh, tag team is going to get out their crystal ball. Um, I'm Barbara Levin. I'll be your host for today. Before we begin, let me give you just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, if you are online or joining just on the podcast today and having technical issues, you can call WebEx Technical Support directly at 877-509-3239. For those of you that aren't online and can't see that number, I'll repeat it again, 877-509-3239. Everybody will receive the link for the recording um, via email by end of day on Monday. Um, we will be taking questions after our pre-submitted questions from the folks that are online, and we'll show you how to enter those questions when we uh, get to that part of the presentation. Also, for privacy reasons, you can see the names of uh, the presenters, the panelists, and your name, but not the names of the other attendees. Our agenda uh, for FISMA Friday is pretty simple. Um, we're going to go through some pre-submitted questions um, that we've received on today's topic. We're going to uh, spend just a moment letting you know how Safety Chain can help you get FISMA ready, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. As always, we're really excited to have our, our TAD team from the Atchison Group for FISMA Fridays, and today we're welcoming Dr. David Atchison and Melanie Newman. So we're very excited to have both of you here. And with that, we're going to just jump right in um, with you, David, and welcome you and ask you, before we get into uh, today's specific topic, maybe you can update us on um, the latest and greatest news from FDA on FISMA. Well, thanks, Barbara, and, and welcome to everybody, and thank you for joining us on the last FISMA Friday of 2014. Um, building up towards a very, I think, interesting and FISMA-centric 2015. But more of that in a second. Um, in terms of updates, not an awful lot to share. Um, comment period has now closed for the re-proposals, the four re-proposals that came out that we've been talking about over the last few FISMA Fridays. Those comments closed December 15th, so uh, Monday this week. And um, that'll be it. We're, I think we're done. Um, the only other minor things that I've seen coming out of the FDA is we're starting to see some, some Q&As and guidance documents coming out with, a, with somewhat of a produce-centric focus. Um, just recently, some things on manure and soil amendments, but nothing very dramatic. So I think, uh, I think that's about it. I, I, the, the news is that there is no news other than the comments have closed, and we need to stand by and now um, accelerate towards uh, 2015. Back to you, Barbara. And get ready for compliance. Yep, thank you, David. We're going to stick with you for, for a moment here. As you just said, the comment uh, deadline is closed. So, so what should we be expecting next from FDA in terms of finally finalizing FISMA? It's hard to say. Well, the, uh, I'm going to just sort of put on one side a second the, the timelines and the deadlines. We'll, we'll chat about that in a minute or two. I, I don't expect an awful lot out of FDA in the context of uh, the seven rules, the seven proposed rules, I should say, the big ones that we've, that we've been discussing, the preventive control rules for human foods and animal foods, produce safety, foreign supply verification, sanitary transport, food defense, um, and third-party auditing. I, I think we're going to see the agency go silent on that. They've had thousands of comments on some of these. I don't really believe they've gone through all of them yet, and they will get, likely get a bunch more based on the reproposals. So they will be going into a huddle on, on the seven rules. I, I think we might, see, we might see other things beginning to pop out of the agency that are FISMA-related, Barbara. I think there may be some other... Um, FISMA-related activities, which again we can talk about in a, in a second. But when it comes to the to the um, to, to the deadline and the reproposals, I think they 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 simply have to digest what they've got and uh, and formulate it into some final rules. So I don't I don't think we'll see a whole lot 
from them in that space, but we may see other activities. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I'm going to shoot one more to you uh, before we uh, go over to Melanie to talk about timelines. David, now that we've, seen, we've gone through several comment periods, we've gone through revisions, what do you think are the key takeaways? And in the end, you know, people are asking, what is FDA ultimately seeking to achieve uh, with these uh, so-called seven pillar rules? Yeah, you know, I, this this circles back, Barbara, to the to the fundamentals that we've been talking about on FISMA Friday since the very first one that we did. Um, and I don't even remember when when it was we first did one. I think I was a small child when we first did FISMA Fridays. It seems that long ago. Um, but but the essence of FISMA is prevention, and, and we mustn't forget that as we look at the lens of uh, where FDA is going to go in 2015 and, and what we should be doing right now in the private sector of getting ready. And um, the fundamental mission of, of the agency back in 2006 and 7 and 8 when I was still there was what can we do to require companies to think about preventive controls? It evolved into the risk-based preventive control thinking, the HARP-C concept. And, and I think that we mustn't lose sight of what fundamentally this is what it's about. It's about understanding where your risks are and establishing appropriate preventive controls to control them. The devil's in the details because I use the word appropriate controls and that creates challenges because regulators and private sectors and others may have different sense of of what's appropriate and how great the risk is because a lot of this is, is gray. It's not, it's not solid black and white. Sometimes it is, but often it isn't. So I think that the, uh, the point that FDA is seeking to achieve here is to drive companies to think about preventive controls, think about risk-based strategies, whether it's in your supply chain or it's internally in your systems, whether you're a grower, whether you're an importer, um, and, and put those, those systems in place. And if you approach it with that attitude, you're going to be, I think, mentally and culturally heading in the right direction. And, and that's what FDA is wanting to achieve from this. They have to put guardrails up. They have to say, you've got to do this, this, and this. And as we know from the proposed rules and re-proposals, there's not much in there that's super prescriptive. Some of the things are, like testing for water and, and testing water for, um, for bacteria, for, for produce. But generally speaking, it's, it's, these rules are about concepts and about understanding that, uh, the risk-based thinking and the preventive control. So that, I think, fundamentally is what the FDA is, is wanting to get out of this. Um, but they've got to put the rules out there, and the other point is that they they want this to apply to everybody. If you are manufacturing and processing and growing an FDA regulated product, you need to have that that mindset and um, and be approaching it in, in in that in that way. So that's a little bit of a ethereal kind of a response, uh, Barbara. But I think that's fundamentally what they're trying to do, and that's what we will see emerge during 2015 and on into 2016 before the administration shifts. Okay, good, good insight. Uh, while, while you were answering, I also looked up our first FISMA Friday was in April of 2013. So, uh, so more than a year and a half, we had 100 registrants for that first FISMA Friday, and we're well over 2,000 registrants ongoing now. So we have been at this for a while, and it's been, it's been very exciting. Um, let's see here, I'm trying to get to my next slide. Um, Melanie, welcome um, to FISMA Friday. You've been a strong participant too um, in, in all of these months. Uh, let's talk about uh, some brass tacks now. When is it anticipated that the rules will be finalized? Thanks, Barbara, and good to be back, everyone. Thanks for having me back to FISMA Friday. And I had to chuckle when David mentioned that he he might have been a small child on our first FISMA Friday because that means uh, you all might have been pushing me in a stroller as a as a baby, possibly. So, uh, <laughs> that's a great vision. <laughs> 
Well, I, you know, I I am younger than David, so I, I just had to give him a little rub there. So sorry, sorry, boss. Um, that said, uh, I just wanted to circle back to uh, question number three before jumping into question number four here on the timelines, uh, because David really did say it eloquently with respect to, uh, although I jabbed him on, on me being a baby and him only being a small child, uh, I do want to give him a lot of credit for how he positioned question number three, because really I think the spirit of FISMA and, and the spirit of FDA's intention of it is going from reactive to proactive and preventative. And, you know, I like to think what, what I'm seeing the industry doing, and, and some are embracing it and some are, um, I don't know, I think really struggling with embracing it is shifting from that mentality. And so when I was in industry, we used to think of, of the regulations making us think, what would you do if? And I put the emphasis on would and if. And FISMA is making us think of, what will you do when? And so that preventive control, the preventive controls rule and the preventive control thinking is, is forcing us to do things like put together a monitoring program proactively, put together corrective actions in our in our food safety plans proactively before they happen. So it's a what will we do when something goes off the rails because we know it will. It, gone are the days where we can say, we haven't had a recall in 20 or 30 years. It's never gonna happen to us. Guess what, folks, with the globalization of the supply chain and all of the other changing risk factors out there, it's not if, it's when. And these rules are speaking that concept loud and clear. So I just kind of wanted to bring that thought process full circle. It's not what would you do if, it's what will you do when. And that's what these rules are really driving towards. And I think what FDA is really trying to drive the industry towards is prepare, be preventative, don't be reactive, because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So I'm sorry I, I diverted off course, but I wanted to share those insights. On question four, timelines and in, in anticipation of when these rules will be finalized. Great question and really the answer in a typical lawyer fashion is it depends. Don't you love that? All lawyers say that it depends. Uh, no, they're rolling effective dates. Um, the preventive controls rules are going to come out first because they were the ones that were first issued. But I really do anticipate that FDA is going to stick really close to these uh, times and timelines that are that are uh, published for two primary reasons. First, FDA uh, really wants to get these rules out and enforced before the administration turns over, so basically before the next presidential election. Uh, and if we look at most of the compliance effective dates, this will happen if FDA sticks to the timeline, because most of these rules will have to be complied with if you're a, a, a very large company prior to the election in November 2016. And I think the second reason that these dates are gonna hold uh, by virtue of the final rule and then ergo the compliance dates is because of the court imposed deadlines that we've seen as a result of some of these consumer advocacy group lawsuits and the court mandated rules that say they've gotta go into effect by certain dates, Barbara. And I think we've got a slide that's built into this presentation that we could display for the folks watching that shows some of the final deadlines. And there then if you are, there we go, magic. Look at that, crystal ball, boom. Got a timeline right in front of us. So uh, then we've got uh, for, for large companies, we've got uh, deadlines for compliance that would be a year after what you see on the final deadline column. Okay, so here are the dates, folks. You'll you'll have these in the slides when you receive them um, on Monday. And uh, as Melanie said, we we don't expect these to to slip. Um, let's go back to you, David, um, for for the next question. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk of you know what FDA might do outside of the so-called seven pillars of FISMA. Uh, maybe you can give us some insight there. You know, for example, will they address traceability? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think they will. Um, 
that's just that's just one example, Barbara. The we we get very focused on the seven pillars of FISMA because they are fundamental to the preventive control concepts that, that I was talking about a little earlier. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that uh, the agency has got a few other to dos on the FISMA list. The um, this includes things like creating a system and a process for qualified individuals to be either trained or certified. Lay that out clearly in terms of, uh, of what that's going to take. You mentioned there on the slide traceability. Uh, the IFT did, uh, did a, a, a robust job on that. I'm losing track of when it was, two years ago, uh, probably at least, and, and Jennifer McIntyre in TAG had a key role in, in driving that. Uh, as far as I know, that report's never been submitted to Congress. So uh, we may see that happen, which will begin to potentially open up the can of worms around uh, is product tracking adequate. Uh, we've got um, the, the VQIP, um, Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, which is one that I keep beating the drum on. I think it's a, I think it's a sleeper. Um, I, will, I will comment that I was talking with somebody in uh, mainland China just um, earlier this week about this. And, and their view is that uh, Chinese companies are, some of them at least, those who are, who are plugged into this, are looking for VQIP because they are seeing this as, as a leverageable advantage for economic and business reasons. So I'm hoping, and maybe this is more David being hopeful than reality, that VQIP will come out as well as some of these other guidance documents. We're waiting for the high-risk food list. So there's a, there's a number of other to-dos that 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 are sort of they link in with the with the main preventive control strategies. So I think I think we will we will see some of those things start to start to pop out um, over the course of, of 15 as well as they're working on the final rules. But mustn't forget that, that the agency's got finite resources. They've got an awful lot to do. They don't have a ton of people doing it. So I probably shouldn't set the bar too high for them. But um, we may see some of that stuff come out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melanie, let's let's go back to you. You know, so now so now we've got deadlines. Um, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are going to be for you know companies in industry as they are beginning to consider what they need to do for FISMA compliance? Because now's the time, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's going to be a lot on industry's plate to be able to bite off all that's in these seven rules of, of FISMA. And, you know, one of the things you've got to do is figure out which ones apply to you, of course. But I think out of all of that, one of the biggest hurdles is going to be how to manage and store and, and retrieve all the massive amount of documentation that, that's on your plate. Um, you've got production information, supplier documentation, all the traceability data, and information that's key in a recall, uh, much less just your day-to-day -day operations that you rely upon. And so having that kind of data and documentation and needing to produce that at your fingertips and having the record retention requirements and being able to provide that over to FDA upon demand um, with the record access, their new record access, um, enforcement authority that is basically that bar has significantly been lowered um, since prior to the, the FISMA rules. Documentation is definitely going to be, in my view, one of the biggest hurdles. And so where do you go with that? I, I really think that companies need to leverage technology to manage this risk. Um, it's going to be key, in my personal opinion, to managing all of these FISMA requirements going forward. Because uh, other than using some sort of an electronic or a technological platform to let you know when key documents are about to expire uh, and things of that nature and just running all the traceability information that you need, I don't know how companies are going to stay ahead of all of that massive amount of documentation upkeep that's going to be needed under the rules. Good insight, Melanie. Let, let's stick with you for a minute uh, to start this this last question before we get to audience questions and then also get David's insight. So uh, what should companies be doing now? Um, should, they, should they be waiting until the rules are final or are there things 
um, and, I, and, and I think I know the answer to this one, that they absolutely should be doing today. And I would absolutely 100% concur with you, Barbara. <laughs> they should start today. They should not wait. Um, and that is not a pull or a plug for either safety chain or tag. <laughs> if you want to take it on yourself, please do it. The message here is don't wait. There is a lot in these rules, and it's going to take time, treasure, and talent to effectively implement these changes. And that is no understatement. It, the, the period of time, though, I understand. Between the proposed rule and the final rule, some companies are going to question, what do I do now? I don't 100% know or have visibility and do what exactly is going to be expected of me. I get that. But one of the things you can do now is create a FISMA team and do a FISMA readiness assessment. Ask yourself, which of the seven rules apply to me? Do they all apply to me? Do five out of the seven? Do two out of the seven? Start there. And then do a gap assessment or a gap analysis to see where am I today? Where do I stand today between my level of readiness and my ability to comply with this rule as I stand today versus compliance date? And then build yourself a roadmap. How do I get from point A to point B? How do I get from today to the date of compliance to be able to say, I will be able to comply when, when I'm supposed to by the date that I'm supposed to. This is going to be a much easier pill to swallow than waiting until the rules are final to start this process because if you only have one calendar year to do it all and you've got more than one of these rules that apply to you, that's going to be way too fast and furious on top of all of the other operational day-to-day items that you've got on your plate on top of having to produce products and meet customer demand and make profit and make your P&L, uh, I would highly recommend doing this strategy. And I might have just sold David Thunder on, on recommending that, but um, we'll see what he's got to say about some other tips. Okay, David. Thanks, Melly. Um, I don't have a lot more to add to that. I think you've, you've offered some practical advice. The um, I think the key messages for, for food companies here is is, is, a, is, a, is a couple um, on, on top of what Melanie suggested. The, the re-proposals have now thrown supply chain risk control and environmental monitoring into the mix. These, these are new ventures, and they're challenging ventures. And the, the behaviors of the FDA over the last several years have illustrated how they repeatedly catch people out with their environmental blitzes and their sampling blitzes, um, and folk get into trouble. So I, I think this is an area where I would advocate that, that any company that's a registered firm that's going to have to be compliant with preventive control rules really pay attention to their environmental monitoring programs. The HACCP systems are likely to be fairly robust. Uh, they're, 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 those are going to translate relatively quickly into a harp C type thinking, um, but but environmental monitoring I, I see is I see as an Achilles heel. Um, the the other Achilles heel that I see in this is the supply chain. This is something that that was in the original statute, giving FDA the authority to require supply chain risk assessments and controls. And they tried the first time around and didn't get it in there, and, and now it's come out in the reproposals, and it's very reflective of the foreign supply verification program. So this is this is area number two, is to look at what you know about your supply chain, and and the expectation will be that you control those risks, um, and through a variety of means. And the other challenge, and we talked about this before, but it doesn't hurt to say it again, is. The FDA is expecting you to look more than one step upstream. If you're buying your ingredient from a distributor and the the notion is, well, you know, the distributor's safe, the burden's on the distributor to make sure that the manufacturer of that ingredient is following food safety principles, that's not quite the way FDA is seeing it, at least in the uh, the way they've published the re-proposals. They're expecting you to go a couple of steps back if you are using that ingredient and relying on that supplier one step, two step, three steps back to introduce the appropriate preventive control measures slash kill step. 
So I would just add that sort of level, I think, of specificity to what, what Melanie said about the environmental monitoring programs and the um, and the supply chain. The other dimension that I, I, I put into this is um, a lot of the work we've done in TAG and others have done have, have looked at GFSI standards and compared them with the preventive control rules. And, and we all recognize that if you're GFSI, you're, in, you're, you're robust. But remember that's robustness with regard to key things like uh, the preventive control rules. It, it doesn't necessarily mean you're squared away if foreign supply verification applies to you, sanitary transport, food defense. Those are those are other areas. So so don't forget those areas, and um, and, and and keep keep that all in mind as you're looking strategically at how to be uh, how to head towards compliance by um, pretty much the end of 2016 across the board, with the exception perhaps of uh, sanitary transport and food defense, which will drift down just a little bit. So back to you, Barbara. Oh, great. Thank you, uh, David and Melanie. So we're going to do a few things now. I am uh, taking uh, us out of full screen. All of you should be able to see the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen now, and you can um, enter your questions and hit send, and, uh, and we'll get those queued up. And while we're doing that, um, I'm going to give you uh, some additional information on how Safety Chain can help and, um, and a little bit of information about what's coming next. Um, as Melanie said, um, you know, most companies um, should be looking at electronic solutions uh, to help them navigate FISMA compliance. And, and we've got a pretty comprehensive solution uh, here at Safety Chain uh, that includes comprehensive supplier compliance, um, the ability to make sure that your plans are being followed to a T with auto scheduling and monitoring and validation. Um, FISMA is about prevention. Um, all food safety data is analyzed in real time for, for real time, you know, non-conformance alerts to allow timely CAPAs. Um, all of the information um, is time and date stamped and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, and available in a central repository of data uh, that gives you on-demand audit readiness. We have a tool um, at, that works with a, a risk assessment tool um, from the Atchison Group um, to be able to use that data for risk assessment and, of course, um, having that data available for um, in continuous improvement. And if you are um, GFSI certified or becoming GFSI certified uh, as a means to get uh, you uh, FISMA ready in the areas where that will help, We've got a powerful GFSI automation tool. And this tool really is about supply chain controls. It's how the name safety chain came about. It's that safety chain along your supply chain. Um, we're going to get to your questions here um, as soon as we see those queued up. And um, let me show you a couple of other things here that, um, that we've just announced um, the first six months of FISMA Fridays for 2015, and you can see those topics there. Um, if you're registered, you don't need to register again. You'll continue to be registered. If you have other folks in your company that you think should register, they can go to FISMAfridays.com. Um, you can see um, how to contact both Atchison Group and Safety Chain if you'd like more information on how we can get you FISMA ready. And with that, let's get to uh, some questions from uh, the audience. And uh, we have the first one from Jonathan. And um, David, I'll, I'll start this out with you. Um, when, when it comes to putting preventive controls in place, what are some of the key things that companies should be doing now? Is that about risk assessment? Uh, good question, Jonathan. I think the, the, the first thing to look at is what your HACCP plan looks like. That's Assuming that you have one, and if you don't, then it, it, it's a similar it's similar concept. But let's assume that you have a hazard plan. I think it's important to to look at that and see how it shapes up relative to the thinking and the requirements in the preventive control rules. So just to remind everybody, it, it, it's it's taking your hazard plan and driving it toward a food safety plan, which is effectively a, a list of to-dos 
including looking at the potential risks, identifying those that, that are significant, and remember that FDA has changed this from reasonably likely to occur to significant. So identifying those that are significant, preventive controls to control those that are significant, the monitoring that's going to ensure the preventive controls are, are being followed, the verifications, the corrective actions, the periodic reanalysis, and the record keeping that's, that's associated with it. Um, we've got to now be thinking about the environmental monitoring. If you're making a ready-to-eat product that is not going to be further processed, that's got to come into this mix. Supply chain has got to come into this mix. Do you have a recall plan? That's coming into this mix, all of these, these, these new requirements. But start with your HACCP plan and look at how you might tweak that. And I think if you have a HACCP plan, I do call it a tweak. Um, there, there's, there's not going to be an, a ton of new things that you're going to have to do, but there's going to be some. So that's, that's where I'd start. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, Melanie, um, question. Um, is the Foreign Supplier Verification Program expectation to identify the actual manufacturer and associated risk or the whole supply chain as in the case of ingredients. It could be two or three or more agents or distributors before it actually reaches the blending facility. It was a long question. You should be able to see it too. Uh, what are your thoughts there? That's a great question. <laughs> and I'm actually looking at it on the, on the screen as well. Um, I mean, the, the spirit of the Foreign Supplier Verification uh, Program is to verify the safety of the supplier and the, the ingredients that they are supplying into the U.S., that they meet U.S. food safety requirements. Um, the we proposals have a, a bit changed the expectation and put some language in with respect to possibly having to do that more than one step back. Uh, with respect to knowing or understanding the risk of your supplier's supplier. We happen to have the expert on the line, David, uh, on foreign supplier verification rule, and I may kick it to him to probably more succinctly explain where those differences lie because I think I think the answer is it, it depends sometimes that with respect to uh, going back one level, um, to verify, and then at other times you're having to go back more than one uh, supplier back to verify the safety of that ingredient. David, can you chime in and maybe do a better job than I just did explaining that? I love it when lawyers say it depends. Um, I'll read you on that one forever. The, um, my read of this, Barbara, is that we have to look at the purpose of foreign supply verification and just try to tweak it apart from the supply chain risk control requirements in the preventive control rule. The essence of foreign supply verification is for importers. And the mission to the importer is you go back one step and you make sure that that manufacturer, processor, grower is following the rules. Are they complying with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act? It's, it's one step. And FS, uh, foreign supply verification makes it pretty clear that you do not need to go back beyond that to meet the requirements of foreign supplier verification. So it's one step. Now let's look at this through the lens of I'm a U.S. manufacturer um, and I am required to be compliant with the preventive control rule. The new reproposals is basically saying part of that compliance with the preventive control rule is understanding and controlling the risk in the supply chain. Um, irrespective of where that supplier or suppliers are, whether they're in the neighboring state, whether they're in a different country. So my belief of that is that if you are relying on a company to control the critical risk or the significant risk, let me use the right language, to control the significant risk, and say that, say that, com that company is in Vietnam, that is controlling the significant risk. They are then shipping that product to China. I'm just making countries up here in terms of the supply chain. And in China, they are doing something with that product, um, maybe just the distributor. They may simply be just repackaging it, and then they are selling it to you. 
My belief is that FDA is expecting you to be compliant with the preventive control rule is, is to go back to the Vietnamese manufacturer who is controlling the significant risk and make sure that they are doing it. Just saying, well, we checked on the distributor in China who we buy this stuff from, that would make you compliant with phone supplier verification, but it would not make you compliant with, I believe, the essence of the supply chain risk control and the preventive control rule. The good news is that if you are a registered firm and you're doing that level of due diligence to control supply chain risk for the preventive control rule, you really don't have to worry about foreign supply verification program at all because you've got it all covered. So it, it was a really good question, and I and I am providing what I see as the interpretation and the nuance between the, the, the two rules. But I, the the essence of the supply chain risk control for the preventive controls is is to go back one step, two steps, three steps, and find the point where that risk is being controlled and make sure that it is being controlled. Um, so that's that's how I, I see it, just to sort of build off uh, what Melanie started. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, interesting question here, David. I'll start with you on this one from Marie. For companies that have been traditionally regulated by USDA, like meat and poultry companies, what are some of the ways that will be impacted by FSMA? Well, that's a really good question. I, I think the most obvious one is what the, the sanitary transportation rule, which it, it was, was, as we've discussed before, is a rule that was sort of, um, it originated back in 2005 as a, as a new statute, and FDA didn't do anything in terms of actually promulgating a rule on it, a proposed rule, and they, the FISMA forced them to do that. So it encompasses USDA and FDA. So that's that's one area where where we'll see an impact. Um, I suspect the um, the other area will be a lot of meat companies are are looking for value add these days. Just selling meat products per se is is not necessarily giving margins that companies can gain if they do extra things to the meat like marinades like preparing it in some way like doing innovative product development often those products involve um fda regulated spices and other blends and flavorings and that type of thing there we will start to see that being impacting the, the meat and poultry folk because their supply chain will be impacted by FISMA. So I think it's important just to be looking at your supplier if you're a meat and poultry person buying those types of ingredients that are FDA regulated and making sure that your suppliers understand that they're going to have to be compliant with these things so your supply chain doesn't dry up. Um, the, the other obvious area is dual jurisdiction facilities where where the, the, the FDA side of the of the business is going to have to be compliant, and the USDA side will be business as usual. But so that's 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 an obvious difference. But I but I do see that the supply chain again. You know, I'm circling back to that over and over, because um, not only do do we see that as some of the biggest vulnerabilities in today's environment from a food safety perspective, it's it's in my view one of the hardest things to control and get your get your arms around. It's so complicated, um, and it can be very very um, costly to, to do that um, unless you're using something to help focus where your risk is. So there's, there's just a couple of thoughts. Sanitary transport, supply chain of, of ingredients that you may be using to create value-add products if you're a straight meat and poultry um, producer. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that was our last question. Um, uh, for those of you who would like to uh, submit topics that you'd like to see us add to FISMA Friday, um, if you're online, um, you can uh, put those in comments um, on the form that you should see when you log off, or you can send that to info at Safety Chain, and we'll try to get those on the schedule. Um, with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, David and Melanie and all the, the other uh, members of the tag team for all of the great information. Um, we're really excited to continue FISMA Fridays into the new year. And to um, our participants who join us every month, uh, happy holidays. Thank you for your support, and uh, we'll see everybody next year. 
Thank you, Barbara. Wishing everybody 